When the Nothing Tech Company first launched in 2020, their whole big selling point was that they were going to build technology that faded into the background. Tech that improves your life and keeps you more connected, but without getting in the way of it. And I absolutely love that vision. They launched the Nothing Phone 1, which sort of did that, with this glyph lighting system that meant you could keep your phone face down, but still see your notifications from the back. Then the Phone 2, which did the same thing slightly better. And now we've got our third, the most affordable so far, the Nothing Phone 2A, which is $349 for the top and 12 gigabyte RAM model. And I think this is a really good opportunity, now that this company has had three whole phone releases, to decide, is what they're doing actually achieving their goal? Can using a nothing phone improve your life, make you a more present person, or are these really just basic phones, but with batty designs for people who are happy to sacrifice value to be different? Let's figure it out. So this is the package I got from nothing. Okay, there's a white phone 2A, and then a black. How adventurous. That is kind of the intention though. So let's unbox the white one. It's an unfortunately thin package, which means no charger, but credit where credit's due, at the very least, it's got personality. Unlike the sea of generic phones you have to wade through at this price point. And also funky transparent nothing cable. Ooh, these peels are looking pretty tasty. So the white, and now the black. It's nice to see a pre-installed screen protector on these too. And immediately, the second that you or anyone picks this up, you will get a reaction. It might not be a good one. Drisha thinks it looks like a face with some intestines coming out, which is fair. And I can't completely erase that image from my mind now. When Joseph and my team just burst out laughing. The design is clearly not for everyone, and you are going to have to be ready to defend your choice to people. But there's a few reasons why I personally do rate it. Part of it is the screen. To achieve even slim screen borders like this at a sub $350 price point is very hard to ignore. Like when I cycle between my $1,200 S24 Ultra and this, yes, I prefer the S24 Ultra, obviously, but it doesn't feel like I'm jumping from expensive phone to cheap phone, which in itself is an achievement. Part of it is the sides. It's got a completely fingerprint resistant finish. I love these matte black buttons and also how you can kind of see bits of the rear design through it. And part of it is of course this bizarre uniqueness that you would call the rear. This is a plastic phone by the way, which is fairly standard for the price. But what I like is that they've leaned into that material as opposed to trying to hide it. There's a lot of companies who try and make their cheaper plastic phones feel as similar as possible to their flagships, which are made of glass and metal. But doing that often just makes them feel like knockoff versions versions of the real thing that are lighter than a feather and creepier than your grandma's knees. Whereas with the Phone 2A, this feels like it has been intentionally designed to feel, well, basically like a toy. But you know, a solid, premium, cool toy. You know those fancy robots you'd always see on the store shelves as a kid, but you wouldn't even dare to ask your parents for? That's the vibe that I get from the Phone 2A, especially with this whole glyph lighting interface running through its veins. And whether it is or it isn't, it doesn't feel like yet another mass-produced slab. But what about the software? Because you can have crazy design, but if the goal of nothing is to have tech that truly does disappear into the background of your life in a way that's fundamentally different to anything else out there, then whether or not that succeeds is going to rest almost entirely on what it's like to use. So one part of it is the UI, this black and white, completely stripped back aesthetic, which I like. There's lots of useful widgets. The personalization is great. Like with your folders, for example, you can configure exactly how you want the apps to display and even pick from nothing style cover photos if you find that cleaner. And the AI wallpaper generator, I think is fantastic. It's, ahem, nothing we haven't seen before, but it feels very much tuned with the nothing minimalist philosophy in mind. They've made it easy to make wallpapers that naturally suit the software's aesthetic, with the ability to make them scrolling wallpapers if you want, and to add atmosphere and the nothing glass effect to your creations. Now, don't get me wrong, the software is not exciting to look at, but that's kind of the point. It's trying to strip back the power of any one individual app to demand your attention and therefore control your life. And I'm all for that. The temptation is to say, well, it's just a black and white icon pack. There are literally thousands of those for free on the Play Store. But there is more to it than that, like the lock screen widgets, for example. You get to pick basically anything from live widgets to apps that you can quick launch to device controls, and it's right there for you to use without you needing to even unlock your phone and face your distractions. So every night before I go to bed, I put on airplane mode, so that's there. Torch, because you never know when you might need it. And that is a compass. I've been viewing a lot of potential houses recently, and so any Anytime I want to check what way things are facing, tap, and that is north. 
And also, yes, I have a ton of apps, but very little is actually pre-installed on Nothing Phones. It's clean, and it does genuinely feel like the phone is trying to make you use your tech less, as opposed to most affordable phones, which feel like a gateway to the company then spamming you with promotions or trying to sell you on their services too. At least for now, there isn't any of that here. The software could do with a little more consistency. Like, why when I'm using completely stock widgets do I have three different fonts on my home screen? It's meant to be nothing, not everything. And also polish. Like, the lock screen apps, they should animate in in line with this transition, as opposed to just popping in. But for the most part, it does look good, and it does effectively make your phone less attention-seeking, in a good way. However, I don't think this on its own would be enough for nothing to claim that they're doing something particularly different. What might though, something that you don't see anywhere else, is this Glyph interface. With their past premium phones, they've had many Glyph lighting zones. This being their more budget offering, it's got three. And that is actually completely fine. They still look cool. The lighting is high quality and consistent. And they have somewhat limited the amount that the light bleeds into the rest of the design, which helps improve the perception of precise engineering. But most importantly, you can absolutely tell that this Nothing Company has spent a lot of time in boardrooms, figuring out every possible thing that you can do with a set of LEDs. Like, they can beep different patterns depending on who's calling, which is cool and well executed as a feature. Even if most of the notifications themselves do just sound like a fridge door that needs closing. Or like a smoke alarm that needs its batteries replacing. I don't know, it's very weird. They can light up when you play music and sync to that music. You know the promise of all those Philips Hue lighting strips? Except it does actually work. <laughs> Fun party trick. Probably won't use it, since turning it on enables it for literally every single piece of content you consume, including your morning news update. Essential notifications, though. I think this is such a cool feature. You can choose any one of your apps and then specify any type of notification from that app that you'd like to mark as important. So for example, with your emails, you can choose which inbox counts as high priority. Or for Slack, you could say, well, it's only really vital if there's an incoming call. And once you've done that, anytime one of those notifications comes in from that point, this glyph will stay lit up until you next unlock your phone. Have you ever heard of the saying, there's two kinds of people, those that keep their phone face up and those that keep their phone face down? Well, choosing a nothing phone is basically you declaring that you're part of the down club. This is designed so that when you're out at dinner, for example, you flip the phone over, which can activate do not disturb mode, by the way, so nothing's ringing. And you can rest easy knowing that anything important, you'll still see it. And all the rest of the notifications, well, you can get to them later. That concept, in my mind, is beautiful. And something introduced in the last generation, which takes it a little further, is that one of those glyphs is also a timer. So if you set a stopwatch, for example, you can see the progress. And if you order an Uber, you can see how long till pickup. So all of this sounds amazing. What's wrong with it? Well, while I do like the idea of looking at the back of your phone for a notification, you're losing most of the information that accompanies that notification. So for example, if you're using this to time your Uber, at some point close to pickup, you're going to need to see the number plate of the driver who's picking you up. So you are at some point going to have to turn your phone over and enter the app anyways. Or like with emails, for example, even though it's very thoughtful of them that you can set certain inboxes as priority, the problem is that within any given inbox, there's still going to be vast amounts of variance between the level of importance of each email that an LED on the back just can't distinguish between. I mean, just for an example, over the last few months, my emails have ranged from would you like to take a flight to the United States to interview the CEO of our big tech company to would you like to test our rotating makeup brush? And pretty clear, one of those is more important than the other. And the same is true for messaging. Like, in theory, it makes sense to mark your parents, for example, as important enough to light up the glyph in case there's an emergency. But then the vast majority of their messages are not going to require immediate attention. And so at that point, are those really essential notifications? After using this for a little bit of time, I imagine most people will experience enough false positives, messages marked as important that end up being not very important when they check them, that they start to tune out this essential notification glyph, which kind of defeats the purpose of it in the first place, and now you just look like the fool who left their torch on. Now, I will admit, I have given this whole glyph thing a bit of slack over the last few generations, because it's felt like the rate of improvement was so quick that the next big game-changing update always felt just around the corner. But 
This is the first time that I think I felt that progress slowing down. Yes, this is a more affordable phone. I have no doubt that the next flagship nothing phone will push the boat out a little bit more. But since their last device, like eight months ago, the point where we were promised developers were about to suddenly start having their way with these glyphs, we've had support for like one major new app, Google Calendar. And even that's a bit weird. It just gives you like a five minute countdown before your meeting starts. It does work and I can see the use case, but I mean, if I was at dinner and I'd flipped my phone over, completely forgetting that I've got an upcoming meeting, I would personally much rather my phone buzz me like 20 minutes before to make sure that I knew, as opposed to waiting till five minutes before the meeting and starting a silent counter, just in case I happen to glance over in time. Using this phone has made me feel like we might be starting to reach the limit of what you can do with LEDs. Now, maybe if in the future there was a secondary tiny display here that could summarize everything that you needed to know in a really intelligent, concise way, it could become a game changer. But as it stands, that's about where the Glyph interface's useful functionality ends. And if you're enjoying this video, then a sub to the channel would be tag Glyphic. So before we tie this all together, the final thing that I want to crystallize is if we took away all the nothing extras, is this actually just overpriced for what you're getting? Well, for starters, you've got the screen. This is a 120 Hertz AMOLED full HD plus display. And for the price, it's bright, it's smooth, it's slick. You honestly couldn't really expect better. You get the latest Android 14, which is already more than most phones in this bracket, but also, you know, you're going to get solid support. Three years of major Android version upgrades and four years of security updates. It's got a chunky 5,000 mAh battery, which with fast 45 watt charging that fully charges in basically an hour on the dot, is a nicely rounded battery package. It's not supreme battery life, possibly cut into slightly by the glyph lighting and the extra software that goes into that, but it's good. It's a reliable all day phone. And then for performance, there's either 12 gigs of RAM and 256 gigs of storage for 349. And then in some regions, you can get an eight gigabyte RAM option for cheaper, but that's paired with the Dimensity 7200 Pro chipset. And it's, it's actually gotten a lot faster as I've been using it. When I was first setting up the phone and it was downloading a hundred apps while messing with the settings and the camera at the same time, it was chug city. It definitely got overwhelmed. But as I've settled into more normal usage and the phone's learned my behaviors, it's fine. It's fast for the most part. It's smooth for the most part. It plays the games I want to play for the most part. The only reason I'm caveating it is because every now and again, you do get reminded that this isn't a top tier flagship. Like sometimes when you exit an app, you'll get a bit of lag. Sometimes the camera takes a while to load. And sometimes the photos, when you capture them, a while to process. But those things only stand out because for 95% of the things you do, it will slice through them like butter. So then the only remaining question mark is the cameras. Is that why you're here? All right, fine, go on, I'll take one. And the cameras sound good. This is two 50 megapixel sensors on the back and then a 32 megapixel camera for selfies, which is actually quite refreshing compared to most phones at this price, which try to squeeze like four cameras onto their phone. One will be some crazy 200 megapixel camera and then the rest will be like five and you have no balance. But in the end, as far as its actual output, I'd say it's only decent. In a way, I'm impressed. Like the video it cranks out is on the upper end of what you'd expect. It can take professional photos with that tasty natural background blur. And the camera app, it feels premium, which does make it feel a little bit more like you're shooting with a proper bit of kit. The fundamentals are solid, but there's just little weaknesses all around. Like oftentimes it will apply too much of the high dynamic range effect, which is a common shortcut for cheaper phones because it can make landscapes and city shots look instantly more impressive. But Oftentimes faces and hair, they suffer because of it. Colors are often exaggerated versus reality, kind of for the same reasons, but more jarringly, they aren't even close to matching between the phone's two lenses. Like look how different the wood paneling looks on the main camera versus the ultra wide. Oh yeah, and that ultra wide, even though it is 50 megapixel, it doesn't feel it in day-to-day -day use. It feels distinctly not very detailed. The front camera only shoots in 1080p. There is no 4K. And while it's not bad for 1080p, you can tell that it's lacking as far as 2024 standards go. And the fact that there is no zoom lens means both that zoom shots aren't gonna look too hot and also that you're gonna struggle to take any kind of beautifully framed, supernatural looking portraits. Now, I realize that sounds like I've had an enormous dunk on these devices, but those are the differences I feel coming from a flagship phone. For this price, the cameras are about what you'd expect. It's middle of the line. So where does that leave us? Do nothing phones, and specifically the nothing phone 2A, make your life better? 
Well, I would say it can. I'd say someone coming into this with the right attitude could use the tools that Nothing presents you with to better balance their phone life and real life. But equally, I don't think most of the features have enough depth to make a significant impact for the majority. So if this was a $499 phone that was banking on these snazzy Nothing touches to lift it above the competition, I would say hard pass. But it isn't doing that. What saves this phone for me is that even if you stripped all of it, even if this was just a blank slate with no glyph lights, no monochrome software, no fancy design, it would still be decent value. $349 for a phone with a great screen and even borders, 12 gigabytes of RAM and 256 gigs of storage, great software support, good battery life, and very solid, durable construction is, I think, pretty fair. And yeah, you can absolutely get a budget phone with a better camera than this, or one with a faster chip than this, but these guys have curated a package that is overall pretty spot on for the majority of people. 